This is the One Girl Revolution podcast, a podcast that highlights the stories of world-changing women and girls across the country. We hope that these stories inspire you, but even more so, we hope that these stories help you to see your own value, your purpose, and your power to change the world through your life. Every woman and girl is a One Girl Revolution. This week on the One Girl Revolution podcast, I'm thrilled to welcome Piper Hill, founder of Healing for Heroes, a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting our military service members and veterans lead healthy, productive lives by pairing them with service dogs. Healing for Heroes has dual purposes in that it serves the community by helping military personnel and veterans, as well as local animal shelters by rescuing suitable dogs. I love this organization so much, and this conversation with Piper was eye-opening. Piper is an Army veteran and experienced firsthand the struggles that veterans face after serving in the military and returning home. Piper's passion for supporting other veterans led her to create Healing for Heroes, a transformative organization dedicated to helping veterans reclaim their lives, find community, and find support and love through service dogs. Healing for Heroes provides life-changing service dogs to veterans struggling with PTSD, traumatic brain injuries, and other challenges related to their service. Through her own life journey and witnessing the profound bond between veterans and their service dogs, Piper has seen firsthand how these loyal animals can provide comfort, security, and a renewed sense of purpose. Healing for Heroes not only helps veterans and service dogs find one another, but it also builds a powerful community of support, connection, and hope. On today's episode, you'll hear Piper's inspiring story and learn more about the powerful and incredible impact of Healing for Heroes. Join us as we dive into a conversation about resilience, purpose, and the unique way animals can help us heal. Here's my conversation with Piper. Piper, welcome to the One Girl Revolution podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. We have been emailing quite a bit and I know it's taken a lot. You're so busy and I'm just so grateful to have some of your time to share about your incredible story and the incredible work that you're doing to help our vets. And so I would love to talk about healing for heroes. I know there's a lot that we want to get through there, but before we get into that, I'm always curious about the stories of the one girl revolutions that we highlight on this. And so I would love to rewind for a moment and hear a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and maybe your life before you joined the army. And then of course, like how you got into that as well. Oh Lord, that's, that's a very big span right there. So I was born. No, (laughs) um, I, uh, I guess I had the typical middle class family in America. My dad was in the army. Um, did not know till later that my mom was in the WAC. Um, and they met in the service. Didn't know that till probably after, till I was active duty, I think. Um, so Desert Storm was kicking off and, um, well, it wasn't quite, uh, I was already enlisted and, um, stuff was starting to kick off in Desert Storm. So I enlisted, gotten an incredible reserve unit in Louisiana. It was a 321st MMC, had the best commander I've ever had in my whole entire army career that was my dad so it was phenomenal seeing not just knowing him as a dad but seeing him at work and doing what he did everything he did he did better than anybody but watching him in the service was amazing just his his compassion his forethought what a good commander he was Got to see like a different side of the army too, being around him. But then I also got to see a negative side of the army because I was the commander's daughter. Even though I didn't work directly for him, it made a lot of people angry that I was there. But I always had to run faster, shoot better, be smarter, and to prove myself. But it, I'm glad that happened when I was enlisted because after I got my commission, when I went active duty, as a woman in the service, I still had to do that. I had to run faster, shoot better, be smarter than everybody um, around me. Um, Cause there were not that many women uh, when I went active duty, there were not that many, well, there were definitely not that many army officers at all. Um, but I loved every minute of it. I had a great time. 
it was a great career. Um, and I met some of the most phenomenal people, I think, in the world from all backgrounds, all backgrounds from all across this country and sometimes other countries. I'm sure it was so interesting to meet different people and learn so much about yourself and about the world. And I was going to ask you, you know, what that experience was like being in the military, but you shared a little bit about being a woman in the military. What are some things that you learned about yourself through that whole experience? You know, I think we all beat ourselves up like at the time when you're going through things you're like I could have done this better I could I mean even in interviews like this I don't usually watch them like interviews that I have because I'll beat my why didn't I say that why did I say what I said why didn't I tell this story why so I think we beat ourselves up throughout life just from upbringing and stuff around us in school or whatever but looking back on all the things I did in the military I'm, I'm I can't even at especially at my age now like, I'm like, I can't believe I did that. There's a reason people join the service when they're 18 to, you know, 40 at the most, 45, sometimes 50, because you can do things that physically and even mentally you're all over it. Um, but I look back at it and I'm I'm sometimes blown away at the, the things I did and I'm not really sure. I think I went off topic of what your question was, but um No, that that aligns. And I, I think we learn so much about ourselves in those situation yeah. too and learning our strength right and i'm sure there are so many things that you were like i can't believe i like you said i can't believe i did that and it was good that you were younger and uh maybe more fearless i think a lot of things happen in our lives that keep us hold us back and keep us from being the person that we were created to be but being thrown into that situation for you i'm sure was so enlightening and you learned so much about yourself and you accomplished so much throughout your career in the army too. You ended up growing in the ranks and became a captain, which is incredible. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. There was like bad times too, but it was a lot of fun. Do it all over again. I And I, lear I learned a lot of incredible skills like in management and logistics. Originally, I was going to be an aviator like my dad and my paperwork got lost. I was the only girl in ROTC and I was the last daughter of an officer in ROTC they'd kind of like kicked them all out but I was the last one there and my paperwork mysteriously disappeared and I called my dad cry I was like dad I wanted to be an aviator like you and he said that's okay girly you don't need to be an aviator those are just glorified taxi cab drivers he said you need to be a logistics where you can learn you know, a skill and, and go out and do stuff. But I mean, no offense to, I love aviators. They're wild and crazy and fun, but, um, you know, but he was one too. He was actually served with Chris Christopherson. My dad's life was much better than mine, but I have had a phenomenal, phenomenal upbringing and, and life. Like you asked about before the military, my parents brought us everywhere they could all over the world so that we would know. I think this is why I'm so patriotic. So we, we would go to Mexico, we would go to like just Croatia, we, old Yugoslavia, we'd go to these places where nobody, people had dirt floors and would sweep them. And just so that they would know that we actually had a really good life and not to feel entitled or like anybody owed. They wanted us to see how other people in the world lived. And it was just incredible. It's so important for us to have those experiences. And I, I know, Prior to the military, you had all those great great opportunities, um, great examples to look to, but also throughout your military career, you had so many experiences that I'm sure you look back and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that that happened, or I can't believe I saw that and experienced that. What was the experience like when you decided to leave the military? Because I think that's something that isn't often talked about when you decided to retire. Here you are, this incredible captain and doing great work. What was that experience like transitioning out of the military and coming home? Uh, that that was really difficult because that was not by choice. I wanted to stay in and till I made general, uh, if I could, I, I felt like I could, um, but I, uh, had first, I had a, um, a brain injury at, uh, some point in my career and then, um, it developed into neurological issues. And so it was a, uh, forced retirement. It was a medical board. And, 
I didn't want to be medical boarded. I'm sure, well, no, I couldn't have hit it at all because I, I was a mess. But uh, I had I had a friend in the service and she was trying to hide her injury. And I kept telling her, I said, They're, you're not deployable. They're not going to keep you. Don't even try. I mean, she just was not deployable anymore. So, um, so it was really difficult for me because I did not want to leave. It was quite the struggle. But it, I mean, there was nothing I could do about it. And then... Um, then I felt kind of after that happened, so I was on, I became a uh, TDRL, which is temporary disabled retirement list, which they later renamed the wounded uh, warrior list. And they, they just kind of forgot about me. So by law, you can only be TDRL for five years. They have the, they're supposed you know, according to Congress and whatever the laws are, um, they're supposed to fix you after within that time frame and then let you go. Well, I wasn't really fixable. So, um, but because it was the beginning of both wars, I got lost in the system and uh, I ended up being on the list for almost 10 years. And you're not retired and you're not active duty and people will call, well, civili mostly civilians will call and say, you need to be at Fort Benning, well, Fort Moore uh, tomorrow, or you need to be at Walter Reed tomorrow, or you need to be in San Antonio tomorrow. And I'm, I'm, I was like, I, I don't even drive. I don't even, I can't even see right now. I was blind uh, twice. I went blind, didn't know my name, slobbering on myself. I don't remember about three to four years of my life. But so it was, it was very depressing. And there was no compassion, no compassion. Why. But, you know, when you think about it, back then I was really mad. Well, when I when I knew what was going on, I was really angry. Uh, about it. And I was really mad at the army and the department of defense, but it, it's just a huge machine. And a, it's, it's a huge number of people. They didn't know me from Adam. They weren't trying to not be compassionate. I'm sure somebody would have been, and I've run into people every now and then that go, oh, they would see my paperwork and go, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Like I even had a man at Fort McPherson when it was still open. Um, I said, I think I'm coded wrong. And I brought in my retirement paper, well, my TDRL temporary retirement paperwork. And he said, oh, my gosh, you're coded wrong all across. And he recoded everything because I had been paying out of pocket for medical stuff that I was not supposed to be paying for because I was coded wrong because I was one of the first people that was injured during during both wars going on. Uh, so they didn't know what they just lost me in the system because then you have all these people coming back from overseas and they didn't know what to do with any of them. They're all they were trying to figure it out. And I just happened to be in the first wave of everything since 2002. Yeah, you're, so I was really but now I'm not anymore. I think all I think all that happened, everything that happened, like from me laying in the bed and slobbering on myself till now, it all happened so that I could be here today and run the program that I'm running for other veterans so that they don't feel alone and they don't feel discarded like I did. Watch our Emmy-nominated documentary series featuring the girl inside and in tandem on our website or on our YouTube channel today. Check out onegirlrevolution.com. That's the number onegirlrevolution.com today. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel for our documentaries, videos, and podcast episodes. So many veterans, they get lost in the shuffle, lost in the system. The system obviously Easy. is broken. We could say that about so many different things. In this world, right, the systems are broken and the reality is, is we can all do something though to support our veterans, to support those in need around us. And that's a big part of this podcast is really opening our eyes to the issues at hand and who are people, who are our neighbors, who are our friends, who are our family members that maybe the system is broken around them, but we can step up and support them and build community around them. And that's so much of what you're doing with healing, healing for heroes and all the great work that you're doing. So let's talk about that. How did the idea for healing for heroes come to be? Was there a spark moment that you were like, I need to do something. I need to use my own experience. How did that come to be? Well, so after my, um, like the neuro issues that were going on, I, I couldn't, I couldn't walk. I was in a wheelchair twice. Um, and I was laying in bed at Fort McPherson and something, um, I had seen something on TV. I think it was on, 
animal planet, maybe a dog was doing something for somebody. And I thought, I, I remember this specifically because um, I didn't have enough sense to put my medicine next to the bed. It was in the bathroom and I couldn't get out of the bed a lot. Sometimes I would call the maintenance men at Fort McPherson to, to just to bring me water because um, I couldn't I couldn't get out. Um, so I saw something on Animal Planet and I decided to teach my dog at the time, Valentine, uh, to go to the bathroom to get me meds, which I, I don't know how, I, I don't remember doing it. I don't know how I did it. It's one of the hardest tasks to teach a dog when you don't know how to task train animals. Um, but I did, and that dog would bring me everything out of that bathroom to make me happy. She, I mean, just anything and everything. And she was an American Bulldog. She weighed about 90 pounds. She had like, she was uggo with long legs. So she had um, jowls and then the underbite and she would go to the bathroom and she would get medicine and she would come back to the bed and she would have like three bottles of medicine hanging out of her and she would spit it onto the bed. Sometimes one would be hanging off the jet, like stuck. You know how when you put something dry in your mouth and it sticks to your lips and I'd be like, come here, let me get that off your, off your face. And she would like throw them on the bed and go, did, you know, did I do it? I imagine her saying, did I do it? Did I and go, no, no, go get, go get meds. And she'd go back and she'd grab some more bottles and she'd bring them back. And then I'd go through them and then I'd go, yeah, you did it. And she'd go, yeah, and she'd jump around like a deer. It was so, it was so funny. She just did everything to make me happy. A couple of times she brought me toilet paper, like just, she was getting whatever she could to just fix it. But that was kind of the beginning was Valentine. And then I was, um, watching all these young people come back from Afghanistan, then Iraq. And I was at, at the time, Fort Benning, trying to retire. Uh, I picked a place I knew. They wanted me to go to Augusta, uh, to um, Fort Gordon. That's what it was at the time. And I, I didn't know long-term memory I knew, but short-term I didn't. So I said, I'll go to Benning, because I'd been to Benning like three times in my Army career. So I said, I'll go there. I know my way for the most part. So that I was trying to retire out there, watching these young people come back. And wanted to help him retire. But I mean, I couldn't even retire. I was on the list almost 10 years. So I said, well, I can't help him retire, but I can give him a Valentine to help him, you know, help him fight their battles and help them retire. So that's kind of how it started. The whole inspiration for the program was her. So share with the audience, what is Healing for Heroes and talk about the great work that you do. Um, Healing for Heroes is a, we're a nonprofit, a 501c3 charity. Uh, we train service dogs for veterans with any disability. In the beginning of the wars, it was um, just PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and um, traumatic brain injuries. But now we're all aging, and I'm watching other veterans with other issues come to us th throughout the years see a lot of Parkinson's and Vietnam vets. Of course, diabetes is, you know, huge in the United States. So we do more than PTSD and traumatic brain injuries. We do just about any injury. Completely blind is hard, um, very hard. You train those puppies from the time they're puppies. I can do legally blind, all that stuff. I can do diseases. I can do any injury. Uh, but if you're completely blind, you're you're going to be with me for a little while training something for you to help you, a service dog to help you. But honestly, I'd prefer to leave that to the experts that train seeing eye dogs. Because, but I mean, just because it, it, I mean, I don't want to give you a service dog that is not going to work the right way for you. It costs so much money and it's so much time too to train these dogs. I actually have a reject um, or what do they call it? Uh, he career Drop change out. dog <laughs> yeah. um, who was raised to be a leader dog for the blind. And he just loves to play too much Piper. So he got through the whole program and then they realized that he was playing too much and it was so much money and so much training. So it, it so much goes into training these animals, training these dogs, but also you need to find the right hair, right? The right synergy between the dog and the vet, I'm sure. How do you get connected to the vets that you serve? And then also, how do you find the dogs that you end up pairing with these vets? Um, so word of mouth uh, is a, was mostly how it was happening in the beginning. I mean, we've been operating since 2008. So word of mouth was the beginning, but now the I have like seven VAs that send me veterans from mostly the Southeast. 
Ohio, uh, South Carolina, Florida, uh, Georgia, Alabama, um, Tennessee, Kentucky, North, North Carolina does too, and Virginia. So I guess that's more than seven now, but I have VAs that actually were one of the only groups they will send veterans to to get a service dog. People see my veterans walking around, and there's a lot of them all across the United States walking around with a service dog, and they'll ask where they got them, and they'll direct them to us. What, what was your other question? Um, how do you find the dogs that you oh, end up training? That's a really good story. So, um, so I mean, you can temp test, temperament test all day long for dogs at animal control. We we get dogs from animal control that people can't keep in the community around us. And then my veterinarian, they might have uh, people that can't keep their dogs any longer for financial reasons or the dogs too much. And they'll say, hey, we have this great dog that I don't want to euthanize, would you, and they don't want to bring it to animal control. So I'll go visit them and um, we'll take them in. We've actually gotten a couple of dogs from the veterinarian that were biters, but they they weren't, it's not that they were, they were just kind of like, like say bad children that had didn't have enough structure. And so they like to fight, I don't know. So not necessarily with other, they, they were just biters. They just needed structure and uh, regulation and, just like privates in the army, they just needed to be told where to go, what to do, and needed more rules. But now the dogs from the shelter that we get or used to get, they can pass every temperament test in the world. And then I would get them home and I'd get them healthy or they weren't scared anymore. And then Fluffy that I thought was great at the animal shelter now wants to eat my face off. And I don't really have time to fix that. I turned around one day and I had like 11 non-service dog material dogs that did great in the shelter. So I prefer to get them from rescues that have already sorted that out and know this is a one dog, one home, one dog, dog, or this dog doesn't like children or, or what I, just cause we're, we have classes every five weeks and we do 125 service dogs a year. Um, so I prefer to get them from rescues where they've already decided all that for me. I mean, sometimes there's stuff I have to tweak too, because even they don't know. You don't know what you don't know. Right. Well, and I love so much that you're pairing. A lot of times these animals are forgotten about just like our vets are forgotten about population and you're building community amongst them. And I know also you stay in touch with everybody that you, that you serve, that you work with. And so it really is building this kind of overarching community around our vets, which is so beautiful. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun being a veteran or around other veterans. It's everybody says when they come to training, they're like, I, I feel like I'm so comfortable. We've had probably 30 veterans move here just to be around other veterans. They don't always stay with me and that's okay because it's all about your growth and your life and what you want to do. But they've come here just because it's so comfortable being around other veterans because we all understand each other for the most part and um, get along for the most part. And it's really nice. Piper, this podcast is all about stories. And I know there are so many stories that you could share about veterans that you've worked with, or maybe the animals that you've been able to pair with a new home. But is there a story or two about the work that you do that really you feel like exemplifies why your work is so important that you could share? Yeah, I've got a couple in mind. I have a, um, female veteran that's kind of, it's kind of sad but a female veteran that came through the program um she was a flight nurse um and so we we have a lot of MST which is military sexual trauma it's a lot more than the VA either knows about or cares to admit or the Depart I, I don't know I, it's a lot more though than the numbers say but uh she had been uh gang raped uh by some soldiers, some soldiers, I don't know if they were NCOs, but they were army guys, um, almost died, was pregnant, um, had her baby, uh, but has terrible, terrible night terrors and a lot of anxiety. She, she, and she's little bitty and just the cutest little thing you've ever seen. And she said, she wrote a letter 
to her family. So she has two children with her husband. She wrote a letter and it was a suicide letter and that she couldn't go on and um, just all the things that were affecting her. She just didn't want to be here anymore and it wasn't them and she was sorry. And, um, but she, you know, she was going to give it to them and she applied to get a service dog from us. And then she gave it a time limit of seven days, I think, or four days. I don't remember what it was. Um, and if we hadn't gotten back in touch with her, then she was going to leave the letter and go commit suicide. The day I just happened to be on my phone and saw the this email from this young woman and um, another volunteer had not seen them. She emailed like three times. And I answered her in the, like at two or three in the morning, which is probably three. That's my favorite time to wake up is three. Not really, but I do. I wake up at three in the morning all the time. And I answered her and she said, because we answered that she did not choose to go forward with ending her life. And um, just a phenomenal human being. I cannot imagine not ever meeting her or um, her being like in this world, like, and I meet veterans like that all the time. And they'll tell me stories later about how they almost did it, but we called or they almost did it, but they had the service dog from us. So they didn't do it. And that, but then I think about them and just sometimes they come through class and I just know them for class and then they leave. And then they'll call me years later and tell me I almost did this. And I, I and even that brief moment of knowing them, I'm like, wow, my life would have been honestly different had you not stepped into it, even for that one second. Each and every one of them, I feel like it's an honor that I've gotten to meet them and that they're still here. And there's no reason for any veteran, I say this all the time, any veteran, any soldier, airman, any of them to be deployed as many places as we have sent them as a country and to come back to the United States and think that nobody cares. I mean, they've sacrificed so much. They've lost friends. They've divorced. Their children have you know, turn some of them, you know, have turned against. There's just no reason for any veteran to come back to this incredible country we live in and feel like nobody cares. So if I can give them a Valentine to help them know that somebody cares about them, then I'm going to. You are doing that. And you're such an example to all of us because we all need to open our eyes and see those around us, you know, whether it's a veteran or someone else who's struggling in some way, we can all do something to build community. And, and I am so glad you shared that story because I think about different instances like that, where how, how different my life would be if someone didn't exist, right. Or how different my life would be if someone took their life. And it could be as simple as someone you randomly met at the grocery store and had like a nice conversation. And I met them for a moment and both of our lives moved on. And that was just a moment, but those people are impacting our lives. And we all have that power too, just to be a beacon of light to someone who might be struggling. And we also need people in our own lives to be that beacon for us in the moments when we're having a hard time. Yeah. I have have one more story. It's kind of, it's kind of funny, a little bit funny. Yeah. But um I had this um male veteran and he um he lived in his closet for about I think four years for super, super high anxiety. His wife would bring dinner to the closet. He wouldn't go outside. I'm, I guess I mean I'm sure he went to the bathroom, but he mostly stayed in his closet, no windows, he stayed in his closet. So he had he could not get a new dog. <laughs> he had an aggressive dog in the house, an aggressive female. These are <laughs> probably one of the two only aggressive golden retrievers in the world because I had the other one. Uh, So, yeah, so um, female golden retriever, and then he had two males, so he could not get another one because it's female. So his dog was like six, maybe, six years old, and that was his youngest dog, and he's like, well, I have to train this one because I can't bring it up. So I was like, okay, and it was hard. You could tell in class he was shaking all day, every day. We're training him, training him what to do, and then task training comes, and Past train, like getting meds, the dog actually physically goes to get meds and and carries them in the mouth or in a pack and brings them to you. And uh, so when I'm talking to him about his task training, and this has been a year, it took this dog didn't like cheese, he didn't like treats. It was so hard to train this dog. He did. We I tried stink bait. This dog 
there was nothing he liked to get him motivated to do anything. So it took over a year just to teach this dog, just canine good citizen. So then we're talking about task training. And he's like, well, he's got a service dog vest on. And my trainer at the time was from the Ranger Regiment from the JAG office at that. So, you know, he worked for lawyers. And this, the, my trainer was a black and white kind of guy. There was no in-between, no gray area, no nothing. So I, I tell the guy, I don't want to say his name, but I said, okay, so what tasks does he perform? And he goes, well, he brings me my meds. I said, that's great. Can I see it? He goes, yeah, yeah, he's bringing them to me right now. And I'm like, I don't see any meds there. And I said, where, where are the meds? And he's like, they're in the pockets on his vest. <laughs> And my trainer goes, my trainer's like, Miss Piper, Miss Piper, that is not a task. He's just wearing his vest with his meds in the, in the vest. And um, and he, so he could not perform that task at all. And and my trainer's like, we're failing him. He's going to fail. He, he has got to fail. This is not right. This is not legal. This is, I mean, he dog did other stuff though. But, um, and I said, so I told my trainer, I said, chill out. I don't care. This man lived in a closet for almost five years. The fact that he is not in a closet and he's going out to eat and he's going to things at school. His wife was a teacher. They didn't have kids, but he would go to stuff at school. And he's actually driving to go places. That's miraculous. I do not care that those medicine bottles are in his vest. <laughs> so if he thinks that's a task, it's a task. But now, but legally the dog did do other things that, I said, okay, stop saying that's a task because that's not a task, but your dog is doing this, this, and this. It was like other things that we had actually taught him in class, but this is funny. He was like, yes, he's bringing to me them right now. I'm like, I don't see any medicine. So <laughs> There's hope for everyone. And even the, some of these dogs, they can't do certain tasks, but it's the little things too, right? Just having a companion to go out. And I'm sure this, that just his life changed when this dog came into his, into the picture and into his well, life. I mean, we know from studies in Europe and well, even studies in the U S that having any animal cats and dogs is going to help us live longer and help us live health, healthier, happier logs lives but um but unfortunately having just the dog as a companion does not make it a service dog they have to have legal tasks that they perform and i'm just so glad that this dog that didn't like even stinky cheese or stink bait you know was able to do some stuff for this to make him a le legal service dog because he really he really did need a service dog that's a good clarification too for people i know we've all seen animals at the airport or other places that have a service dog vest and you're like no way is that a service dog like believe me it's not so it's important to get them trained and for them to be legitimate service dogs when they're wearing those vests and stuff If you're enjoying this episode of the One Girl Revolution podcast, please subscribe today on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We have a new inspiring episode coming out every single week, and you don't want to miss a single one. Subscribe to the One Girl Revolution podcast today. Where does Healing for Heroes go from here? We've paired with a uh, organization that's building um, homes for homeless veterans. So we're we're going to be the dog trainers within those compounds. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna train veterans how to train service dogs, how to train dogs, how to groom dogs. People that don't like dogs, maybe like cats, because something is better than nothing. We'll help them with uh, keeping healthy cats or fostering them if they want to. If not. I'm going to take some of the homeless veterans that are capable and want to learn how to do admin type stuff to help me do admin on each one of the compounds that gets built. That is one thing we're doing. We're right now currently in the process. We're building cabins for veterans to stay in. Uh, we're on the south side of Atlanta, so there's not a lot of places where you can go out in nature and, you know, touch butterflies and whatever, <laughs> pull leaves off trees um, because it's such a big metropolis, but uh, we're building cabins for veterans to stay at out in the middle of the woods. And there's like a swampy area where you can fish. There's duck, there's blue heron, there's deer out there. It's, be it's beautiful. 
when I bought it for Healing for Heroes, the lender said, are you aware that there is a, about a nine to 10 acre swamp on that piece of property? It's, it's 60 acres. And I said, yeah, I thought he'd been out. I said, yeah, have you seen it? It's gorgeous. And he was like, no, I just wanted to make sure you were aware. And I'm like, I'm from Louisiana. I love the swamp. <laughs> so, I think it's gorgeous though. And there's a little island in the middle of it that has an oak tree on it. So when it, there's an oak tree, you know, it didn't flood that much. And so I'm going to build a tree house out there. I already built a bridge out to the island for people to walk out there. Yeah, pretty neat. That's kind of the direction we're heading in. I want you to also know we, we do more than just dog training. Uh, we've had many veterans come, maybe about a fifth of the veterans have never owned a dog. So we do uh, dog nutrition. Uh, I give a brain nutrition class to everybody. We meditate every day. Five days of meditation can physically, doesn't matter what's going on with you, can physically change your brain in a positive direction. So we meditate every day in class. Three days of positive speaking, like to yourself or to somebody else, can can change your brain and the way you think too. So we do that every day. Um, no offense to men out there, a lot of men don't like it, but by the time training's over, they're like, "Oh, I'm sad. I'm leaving." I'm like, "I know. It's like summer camp." But the good thing about summer camp is you can come back to summer camp as many times as you want. So I open that up to them to come back as many times as they want. You're doing such incredible work and I can't wait to see where you go from here. And I know that healing for heroes has grown and evolved so much. And I know there's so much work to be done. And so I'm sure that you'll just continue to grow and evolve in so many different ways. And I want to stay in touch with you and continue to support your work in any way that we can. But for people that are listening, what can we all do to support your work and get involved in what you're doing? Uh, well, we need, we need volunteers, so uh, they can go to the website, which is www.healing4heroes.org. They can go to the website, and top right is the volunteer application, as well as the veteran application if they need a service dog. We always need money. Um, that's just normal, though, especially with the economy right now. All the nonprofits are hurting. Uh, but, you know, the most valuable thing you can really do is tell a veteran about us and and tell them, tell them to come. I, I'd be happy to help them. And sometimes the dog is the end of their journey. They've tried everything. And the dog is like the wrapping on on the package, the, the bow on the present. But sometimes it's the beginning of their their journey to get better. And when they come through class, I refer them to um well, it used to be Rocky Mountain Brain Institute. That doesn't exist anymore, but they have a TBI that's real bad. I get them to a uh, hyperbaric chamber somewhere where they can get oxygen. A lot of oxygen in their brain will help heal a brain injury. And um, But they have to go somewhere for counseling immediately because once you clean up all that fog, you remember. You remember everything that happened. Well, maybe not everything, but you remember stuff that you didn't remember before and you can go, go kind of kooky. Um, if it's PTSD or MST, I will, and they need that and have it dealt with them. I'll send them to uh, Road Home at uh, Rush University in Chicago or Home Base in Boston. It has a wonderful military sexual trauma program. So it's more than just dog training. There's a lot of support and um, there's other places that are available to help them that are no charge to the veteran like us. We are no charge. There are so many great resources out there, and I know that you are just doing so much great work. So I will be sure to put your website and all the different ways that people can get in touch with you to support the work you're doing, to volunteer, to get involved. I always say on this podcast that the free and easy way for people to get involved in the great work that people like you are doing is just to follow you on social media and share it because yeah. you don't know you don't know who in your like social media community might really need the work of healing for heroes right. or just be right. to be connected. So it's so important for us to use social media to share these great resources. And I know that you have so much going on and I can't wait to continue to follow and support everything you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for having me too. You're so welcome. Before I let you go, I have a couple of last questions. Piper, you're such an inspiration to me. And I know there is so much of your own story that really kind of affected you getting into healing for heroes. But 
if you could get to the very root of why you do what you do every single day, especially those days when it's really difficult. And I know you're dealing with really difficult scenarios and, and stories from people, but if you could get to the very root of why you do what you do every single day, what would you say that root is? I honestly, I, I just don't want anybody to feel like I, I felt very, very dis discarded and alone and I didn't want to be here anymore. I really didn't, didn't know exactly what was wrong, but I knew something was wrong because nobody talked about PTSD or or my brain injury. Or, uh, I just knew I was not the person I was before my injury, and, and I just didn't want to be here. And like I said, there was no program, so I don't want other people to feel like I did. But I also want to say if you're ever in a dark spot like that, just reach out to somebody. Just tell somebody. D don't take that step and, and end it because I guarantee you there's somebody there that is going to be completely lost without you as a person in their life. There really is. And there are people like you and communities like Healing for Heroes out there where there are people that know maybe not exactly what you're going through, but n can relate, can relate to certain things that you've experienced. And I think that's why organizations like yours are so important, so critical just to build community around people. So even if you're listening and you know a veteran out there who might need the support, I just encourage you to give them the website, tell them to reach out to Piper and the incredible organization Healing for Heroes. Piper, you are a one girl revolution. That's why I wanted to have you on the podcast. But who is a one girl revolution in your life? Who is a woman or girl that inspires you? I, you know, earlier it was like clear as day, the answer, but, um, now I'm completely changing. I, it's really a toss up between my mom and my sister. I mean, my mom hid the fact that she joined the WAG. She left home. She was like 16 when she left home, went to Texas on a motorcycle and went to model and, um, ended up in the WAG and, uh, just hid that from us our whole lives. And I don't know, she's a powerhouse and super smart super smart, was always valedictorian and in school and co high school, college, and uh, just incredible. But then my sister too, my sister's always been kind of a lone wolf and a scrapper and just could take the bulls by the horn and throw them on the ground and, and be triumphant everywhere. She a single mom and just, well, now she's married again, but um, just an amazing human being. And they both have the Two different, completely different people, but they both have the biggest hearts in their own way. And just, um, and they do, they keep, when I get down and want to quit doing this, they, they both inspire me to keep going. They'll give me the, say the right thing to keep going when I don't want to go anymore. Uh, like with the organization, I, I want to be here, but I, sometimes, sometimes I'm like, this is a lot of work for, for no pay at all. I'm just doing this to help people stay on this planet and finish their journey. Yeah, it's a lot of work that people don't realize. They're like, oh, cool, Piper, you're doing great work. But there are really difficult days. And I think it's so important for us to identify those people, whether it's our moms, our sisters, our friends, build our own community because we need that support system too, especially in those difficult days. So shout out to your mama and your sister. For people that are listening, what's the whack? Just in case they don't know. Oh, no. The, oh, I'm sorry. That's right. The Women's Army Corps. And she told me the story. She said, she like, I found the reason I found out she was in it, I found some in a shoebox, a picture of her in an army uniform with a kettle helmet on the old ones. But she said, like, when they would eat, um, they'd go to the chow hall to get their food that the men would give her oatmeal with maggots in it. <laughs> she was like, like, so she didn't she didn't stay very long I don't think but she never told us the whole story so I don't know but I just can't believe she even did that <laughs> but it was the women's army corps and it was um you know around during Vietnam I think it ended shortly after Vietnam ended awesome yeah I just want to, in case somebody was listening and they were like I don't know what that is just to save them from having to look look it up on google but Piper, last question that I always end this podcast on that I'd love to ask you, if you could leave women and girls around the world with one message, what would it be? Follow your heart. Like whatever you see that you want to do, just do it. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. I cannot tell you how many people 
told me I couldn't be in the service. How many people from high school were like, what, you're joining the army? And, you know, just what's, I mean, looking back, I mean, yeah, I guess it was surprising based on my life before that, but don't let her, anybody ever tell you you can't do something because you can do and be whatever you want to be. You so. are such an example of that. And I can't wait, can't wait to continue to follow everything that you're doing. I can't wait to continue to follow Healing for Heroes and all the great work that you're doing. I will be sure to put your websites, your social media, all of that in the show notes so people can easily get in touch with you and share your information. But Piper, thank you so much for being on the One Girl Revolution podcast. And thank you for all the incredible work that you do. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's, it's so fulfilling. Thank you for having me. For more from One Girl Revolution, to listen to all of our podcast episodes, watch our Emmy-nominated documentary series, follow us on social media, donate to our nonprofit organization, and more, please visit onegirlrevolution.com. That's the number one girlrevolution.com.